We're talking about yeah, interviews. Yeah. You, you didn't want me to do that. Fine. I was showing you. Yeah. It's hot. Let's go. You're up, Joe. Yeah, 2011, fall. Yeah. yeah. So let's um, welcome Dr. Hooper today. All right. Welcome. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to speak. And I've been told if as long as I'm here, I can speak without this. So this is wonderful. It feels like a little like real and whatnot. So. Um, we got a lot to do and not much time to do it, so we're going to get, uh, get rolling. Basically, the talk is in two parts. We're gonna talk, I'm going to talk about some of my work at uh, sort of at, but also here relative to my Fermilab uh, um, experiences. And then I'm going to switch over to something I've been working on with a bunch of uh, Lewis undergraduates uh, here at uh, Lewis University. So it's kind of like two major issues or topics that we're going to explore, uh, and we're going to do it pretty quickly and um, go from there. So the outline, we're gonna hit the mu, -E, uh, the mu to E experiment, the sort of the, I always like to start with the why, why are we doing this, how are we doing it, and then specifically I wanna spend some time on what we're doing, specifically uh, my former graduate student here. And then we'll talk about some exotic uh, materials to actually per, uh, propel spacecraft into space. Again, the why, the how, and what we're doing here at Lewis University. Some preliminaries. We've got to make sure we can speak the, r the right language. Uh, our units are perhaps a little bit different than what you're accustomed to. Um, so energy is expressed in mega electron volts or giga electron volts if things are really cooking. So one electron volt if you require, if you remember, is the kinetic energy necessary to uh, gain, uh, basically uh, gained by an electron passing through one potential or one potential difference of one volt. Basically a 100 watt light bulb burning for an hour requires something like 10 to the 15th GeV or giga electron volts of energy. Uh, to put it another way, these pesky little guys that are no longer around because they're freezing to death, yay, um, carry with them a kinetic energy of about 1,000 giga electron volts, okay? Um, but of course, uh, we also speak in terms of the language that everything can be related to energy. Uh, that was, uh, of course, described to us for the first time over 100 years ago by this individual, uh, Mr. Albert Einstein. So we'll speak a lot of terms of mass and MeV per C squared or momentums, which we'll speak a lot about in terms of mega electron volts per unit of C. All right, that's just sort of the appropriate language in terms of the scales that we're dealing with. All right, so the mu to E experiment, really, why? Why the mu to E experiment? Well, the new periodic table that we know about up until now looks like this. So we have, uh, this was just found uh, not too long ago at CERN. If you were to break things down to their fundamental pieces, this is what the picture looks like. We have this uh, row right here. Uh, these guys, which are called the charged leptons, our good old friend electron is here, and then it's basically its heavier cousins, uh, if you will, live here, the muon and the tau. Um, in this chunk of it, we have the electron related to its associated neutrino, and we speak of them as carrying essentially a quantum piece of information called flavor. We give it this weird name, but really represents um, a piece of quantum information, almost like a quantum number, a quantum address that these things carry. And we say that those carry electron uh, lepton flavor. These carry muon lepton flavor and the taus carry tau lepton flavor. That's really important from the standpoint of understanding why mu to e is coming into existence, okay? Now, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of questions associated with this. Number one, you don't see gravity in there. 
Okay? We don't, at this point, know how to actually incorporate gravity into this picture. Number two, well, another question is, if it shows up here, there's potentially a whole other copy of this called supersymmetry. Um, they may exist, we don't know for sure. Uh, other questions, why did the universe pick three different copies of essentially the same thing? Now they gave them different masses, we think we have a, a bit of an idea as to why that is. The Higgs sort of points that out, but why three copies, okay? Those are some fundamental questions that we don't have answers for at this point uh, in, the, in the scientific community. So. Now on to mu to e and sort of the law that we think that we're trying to understand whether it is broken or not. So the standard model, this, the, basically that picture that I showed you before, apparently holds lepton number sacred. That is to say, any process that comes in with a certain lepton number must leave with exactly that same lepton number. So let me show you a Feynman diagram here of a pretty typical process. On the left, I have this thing bringing in one muon lepton-like flavor of information. And then it leaves with, or its daughter products give us one lepton one mu lepton object, one electron uh, lepton object, negative one electron object, and if I sum that up, I get one muon number leaving. So, the math is pretty easy here. One equals one. All right? So, we think that nature holds that balance extraordinarily sa uh, sacred. We call that sort of conserved, all right? Okay? So, when we look at these kind of processes, this is what we see happening all the time. Okay, but what we're looking for at mu to e is a process that looks like this. We're looking for something where the muon, in some sense, mysteriously transmutes into the electron and thus violating this sacred number. So this diagram would be a possible violation diagram where I have one muon lepton object coming in. You can see the question marks. The question marks mean we don't know what's happening. We're looking for it. And on the output, we have zero mu lepton number out. So this is an equation that says one does not equal zero. That would be what we call a lepton flavor number violating process, also known as the charge lepton flavor violating process. If we were to witness this, this would be a pretty clear indication that something model holds true is being broken. And that's a clear indication that there's something else going on Okay, so we're really looking for the existence of some new physical process occurring at this very quantum mechanical level, level that we've never seen before. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we basically need muons and we generate a bunch of muons. We run them into a target of atoms and because the muon basically is like an electron, it can get bound up and often it will transition down to the 1s orbital and radiate off some radiation to do, do that. And let me back up here real quick. So the muon comes in, gets possibly bound up in, the, in an orbital, and then transmutes. It's that blink from mu to e that we're looking for. And then it's possible the electron leaves, and if you, if you work out the energy of this thing, that electron, if that happened, should leave at 104.973 mega electron volts of, of kinetic energy. A, a very, very concrete number, okay? So this would be a signal that this transmutation has actually occurred inside of uh, this object. All right. Uh, now what happens most of the time is that this muon will actually get captured by a nucleus and transmute the nucleus and the nucleus spits out some daughter products. You got hadrons and photons uh, in, the, in the final state. So that's a very different signature than what we're looking for. All right. That would be considered sort of a, a kind of a primary background. Uh, or the, the primary uh, uh, signal, or not signal, but the, the primary process by which we sort of normalize everything too. All right. Um, it's also possible, this one's a little bit tricky, but it's also possible the muon gets in here, transmutes normally, and these neutrinos go flying off, and this thing will just happen to have the energy that looks kind of like the signal energy. All right. Okay. So, this is the game, and this is one of our uh, backgrounds for looking at the signal, the muon decaying in orbit background. And that will occur at about something like a 39% level for aluminum, the, le the muon getting captured by an aluminum target. So the, the bottom line is this. We call this the coherent conversion rate. Uh, think of it this way. 
uh, in the numerator, we have this rate of something new. That's essentially the signal. That's the thing that we're looking for that has never been observed before. And we divide it by the something no, known, basically this known capture and conversion down here. All right. So the something new would be the charge lepton changing flavor or type directly from a muon to an electron. All right. So that's really the story of the motivation for the mu -E experiment, is to run an experiment to look for that process, to see whether you can actually see that occurring. All right, where does this happen? Here's a picture, relatively recent picture, well, it's a, uh, of, of the uh, uh, Fermilab campus, the so-called the so muon campus. Uh, there is w uh, Wilson Hall, where Dr. Kaz and I used to work, would be over here somewhere at D0. We work together over there. Uh, there's the old Tevatron ring, and there is the MUTE building right here. All right. So, in terms of an overview of the experiment, so you produce, you need to produce these muons to basically run into aluminum. All right. So you need to produce them. You need to produce a lot of them. So how do you do that? You actually start with a proton beam, and you run it into a target over here, which is uh, I believe going to be I believe going to be made out of tungsten. And a whole bunch of things happen. A whole bunch of shower of material comes this way. And then every once in a while, you'll get a backscatter of actually a charged pion that comes this way. It curls around in these solenoids and then turns into a muon. So essentially, you generate a muon beam that you bring back over to here and you run into what we call the stopping target. That's where those, those aluminum atoms are at and available. All right. And this is sort of to scale. That is a, uh, a picture of a, a kind of a standard size person to give you an idea and also an idea of the strength of the solenoidal fields that we're talking about from like 4.6 Tesla down to 2.5 and so on. So there's all kinds of wonderful engineering going into making sure that we can handle these type of uh, magnetic fields appropriately. All right. And when things are running, you do not actually want to be standing here. The radiation hazard would be, shall we say, uncomfortable. <clears throat> All right, so the proton beam, we actually pulse it, and it's a whole bunch. It's something like uh, 30 million protons per, pu per pulse that come through. And then another thing that we need to make sure we do is we pulse hard, and then we want this thing to shut off. And the reason for that is it takes a finite amount of time for the muons that we want to actually get to the stopping target. All right, and we want to make sure that this thing, that the, the number of protons not in the pulse over the protons in the pulse is at the 10 to the negative 10th level. The reason for that is that would constitute a possible background that would not be acceptable for the, uh, for the experiment. Because remember, we're looking for something that is so subtle it's never been seen before. So we have to understand our backgrounds extremely well to make sure that our background didn't pop something that looks like a signal. All right, so we really have to squash those down at a pretty significant level. Uh, just an overview of some of the uh, detection devices. Uh, this is a picture of the tracking system. It's 18 stations of double layer, uh, basically little straw tubes that have little wires in them. Very low mass, momentum resolution target is something on the order of 0.1%. Uh, the calorimeter is this device here, two disks, each with 630 cesium iodide crystals. Um, and each one of these crystals, these crystal arrays are read out by SIPM arrays. And here's just a, um, some uh, initial data on uh, test beam data to suggest that the, uh, the uh, chunks of this detector are actually performing uh, up to par. All right. Uh, another one of the detectors, which is really important, is this is a detector not looking for signal. This is a whole detector that wraps the entire building to keep something out, or basically to recognize that there is a background that could be leaking in that the universe generates all the time, and we have to uh, take care of that. This is the so-called cosmic ray veto detecting system, or the CRV. You can see here in a mock-up, there's a little bit of a person right there. Right? You can see that basically this thing envelops the entire experiment. Okay? Um, what's really important about this is that this thing needs to work at a ridiculously good level, 99.99% level. Because if it didn't, cosmic ray muons can basically mimic the signal in the detection, detection system. So we need to be able to say, hey, there are some cosmic ray muons running around in the system during the time that we're taking this data, and we have to veto that. That's why this is called the veto detector. All right? And if we don't take care of this, this will swamp, and basically we'll be looking at nothing but this, which is actually not that interesting. 
all right, for what we're looking for. The thing I want to point out here is Nick Mesmer, um, a former graduate student, he just graduated in May, by the way, uh, worked exactly on this. I want to highlight a little bit of the work uh, that he does here in a second. Um, my uh, colleague, Andre, Dr. Andre from Fermilab, will actually give you a, a much deeper dive into the mu to e experiment uh, with some more updated pieces of information uh, later in December. He's actually going to come give a colloquium here and, and talk more about this at, at, uh, more in depth. If you want to know more about the MUDE experiment, go ahead and take a look at that link there and you can find all kinds of additional information. But let me just turn and, to and highlight uh, Nick's work on the CRV. Uh, so there's just a picture of his um, cover page from his master's thesis. and. What Nick did was he actually uh, went down to Virginia. He also worked at NIU and really started to understand how the CRV is built and what components go into reading it out. Um, so here's a picture of Nick, Nick actually at Fermilab. And what he's doing here is he's actually taking light, tight, uh, light tightness type data. So this is uh, some of the modules from the CRV that have been constructed down south and now reside, several of them reside at Fermilab. And what he's doing is basically quality control work. Because even if a little bit of light gets into these devices, right, they will not and cannot work at that really, really high efficiency level of 99.9%. Okay? So it's very important to know whether in transit some of these things opened up a little bit and light leaks into here and therefore degrades the response of this. Okay? So Nick had been doing uh, some work on that. He also then did some analysis and some uh, simulation analysis to double check the efficiencies calculated by other members of the collaboration. So essentially what Nick did was he was tasked by the CRV group to essentially do his own efficiency calculation on some of these devices. And what they're doing is what good scientists do. They're comparing and contrasting their results to see how stable they are. Okay, and here's just get an idea out of Nick's uh, thesis just how good his uh, efficiency calculation turned out to be. So 0 0.99999, which is larger than the required number. So his calculations seem to show that these devices will work even better in principle than they need to work, which is a good thing because nature dictates you build something that works great, but over time we know what happens to it, right? It basically gets worse and worse and worse as time goes on for a variety of different reasons. <clears throat> All right. Uh, again, Nick double checked and worked on understanding these efficiency curves or inefficiency curves uh, for the collaboration for his, uh, uh, for his thesis work. And uh, Nick graduated uh, in May and is off down, down south in Florida, probably enjoying a little bit more heat than we are today. Okay? All right, so now let me switch to my work and something that happens more locally here at, uh, uh, at Lewis. So my work studies, tries to understand what goes on in this horrible, horrible shower of a mess of particles. This is a simulation of just one proton bunch hitting the production target and the shower of forward moving particles that come out of this. So remember that one picture I showed you earlier, that a picture of that woman standing in one, that one spot? That, to use bad English, that ain't nothing compared to the radiation hazard you'd experience standing here. When this thing cranks up, you do not want to be there. You would be in bad, bad shape very quickly. Okay? So I mentioned the extinction, this idea of making sure that the number, the protons essentially are bunched up in time where they should be, all right, and not leaking out over uh, the different time window. Well, we do that, one of the ways in which we do that is we test, to, we, we monitor the response of that by, there's the production solenoid, or the production solenoid in the target. That shower of particles on the previous slide basically comes out of this in this dimension. And what we do is we sample a slight little sliver of that and run it up in here into what we call the extinction monitoring detector system. All right, and this is situated downstream of the of the production solenoid, the target, um, and its goal is to measure and sample that shower from time to time, and go, yep, things are actually behaving nicely, or things have gotten completely crazy, and 
be careful of the data that we're taking. You can't rely on it because the backgrounds are going to be too high. All right. So I was tasked, as it turns out, somewhat fort fortuitously, back um, a year ago, well, a little more over a year ago. So the pandemic hit. And there's, well, let me back up. There's supposed to be a detector here, which we call the fast feedback panel detector. All right. And this detector's purpose is to quickly gather some of that showered information and feed it back to not only us, the physicists running the, uh, the detector system, but also the accelerator people who are actually cranking this thing up, okay? So that's its goal, it's supposed to do that. It was built just as the pandemic hit. And what that meant was it was just sitting around because of the shutdown, basically my colleagues at Fermilab as well as NIU couldn't go into their labs to take any data. All right, but I was so fortunate enough to talk with our dean, Dean White, and say, hey, I see an opportunity here. Would you be so kind as to allow me to go into my lab where I will be by myself behind closed doors? And he said, yes, just follow the protocols, okay? So I got my hands on the brand new piece of hardware, uh, basically July of 2020, and I spent a good chunk of time actually trying to understand how it works. So this is a panel that's roughly 40 centimeters by 40 centimeters. This is a scintillation panel embedded with wavelength shifting fibers. Okay, this is physically what it looks like. Now it was built by our, our colleague Sasha at NIU. This is what it looks like. This is when it first showed up on my desk back in July. Um, this is the, so the inside the panels in here, right? The, the active environment. This is, this is just some, um, uh, some um, outside skin to make sure that the thing is light tight. Uh, it's actually read out by a Hamamatsu PMT, and here's the specs on that. And I got to work pretty quickly. I said, hey, you know what? I have the panel. What do we want from this? We, we probably want to know how it responds to high voltage and a variety of different things. So this was sort of the goal sheet that we came up with. I want to use cosmic ray muons to understand the, po the panel's actual response. We think in simulation we know how it should work, but that's not good enough. We need to confirm that. Determine how uniform or non-uniform the response is. Develop response maps that can then be fed into the simulations to make them better. Okay? And then also understand response versus high voltage settings and so on. Right? Really put this thing to the test so we know exactly how this thing behaves. So I got to work. I've got a nice scope down in the lab. Um, I set up a, a, a single trigger, and this is sort of what the panel response looks like for, for a pretty sizable signal here. All right? I just energized things up, put things in there, a simple trigger on the oscilloscope, and I started seeing what I'd expect to see out of a PMT like this. All right? But that's not good enough. I want to do something more. So then I decided to um, utilize an additional photomultiplier tube and scintillator and build a cosmic ray telescope. What this does is if this thing lights up and that thing lights up and I sandwich the, this in between, I'm pretty confident that a cosmic ray muon actually has gone through here and I can use that to understand the response of the panel. Okay? And that was the plan. I just had to build some cosmic uh, ray uh, trigger counters, which just so happens I had some new hardware for Intermediate Lab. I said, hey, the lab's not going on. Let me actually build this with the hardware that I have. So I've got some uh, 100 millimeter by 25 millimeter diameter general purpose plastic accelerator, wrapped them up in Tyvek, of course, duct tape, because duct tape is critically important for anything that you do in life. That's pretty much axiomatic. You should probably write that one down. Uh, I happen to have a nice uh, new Hamamatsu PMT, actually two of them. I directly coupled them and then um, wired them up and came up with this. And this was sort of the schematic. I've got my PMT in, uh, top counter, bottom counter. From now on, I call this PMT1 and PMT2. PMT1's on top, pmt is on the bottom. The thing I'm trying to study is sandwiched in between. Why? Because if PMT says, PMT1 says cosmic ray muon, PMT2 says cosmic ray muon, then by God, it must have gone through the panel, all right, geometrically. All right. Um, I ran things through some discriminators, the coincidence units uh, into my scope, and then I've read, thing out, uh, read everything out through a uh, VXI interface to the Cat5 line to, to a Mac that's sitting there. And I got all the, all the, all the nice tools to actually do that. So um, this is what, kind of what it looks like or what it looked like. I was, uh, I believe the young man is here, a beautiful, a wonderful chemistry undergrad helped me out with the 3D printing, right, to help me uh, build the holders for this. We got to talking and said, hey, you know what, the 3D printing these would be fantastic. 
So uh, we came up with a plan and rigged up a plan here. The only issue was these were not as light tight as I anticipated. So that means light was still getting in. So I literally had to take them and dip them in cans of black paint over and over and over and over again to get them light tight. But I did several studies to make sure that at the end, once you close these things up, there's no external light getting in is what you want. But you can see sort of what the setup looks like, the panel uh, in my lab down the hall. Okay, Proof of principle, initial runs. I set up my uh, discrimination uh, settings, my high voltage on the trigger counters, and basically I look at PMT1, PMT2, and then the, the, the panel response. And you can see beautiful correlation in terms of time, maybe a little bit hard to see, but this is negative 300 to, three, to zero nanoseconds. You can see how well correlated they are in time, as they should be, because the muon from the cosmic ray muon, it's basically traveling at the speed of light. Okay. So it takes essentially zero time to go from PMT1 through the panel to PMT2. So if things are working, what do I extract? Well, I'd like to know the performance of this thing. One of the things we'd like to know is basically you know, how much charge is kicking out uh, and so on. So I collect waveforms. Um, I extract basically the waveform minimum. I call that uh, min V. Uh, the time in which that occurs, I extract that, and here's just some sample histograms of the data that I collect here. I also calculate the integral over this waveform, and that's proportional to the amount of charge that the panel is kicking out. All right, so that that's essentially can, can tell us its response, how well it responds. All right, and I have a histogram of that. I collect that. I also take care of. I I, I remove the pedestal and any offsets that I know are are in the system because of the oscilloscope and so on. All right. I also create this. What what I was thinking here was, hey, I'd like to feed this back to my simulation friends. They would like to know what a sort of typical response waveform looks like from the panel. So what I've done here is I've taken the individual waves several of these, I've created essentially an average of those, and I've created what I call AV, AVG wave, right? So an average wave response for the panel under these certain conditions. And that's something else I, I gather and I have available to my, uh, to my colleagues, okay? So in terms of scan protocols, uh, I've initially thought of something doing something radially, but then of course I looked and like this thing's Cartesian, so I basically build a Cartesian grid. I define 0, 0, 0 at the center of the active part of the panel. Um, here's my limits on X and Y. Uh, and then you can see here an edge view of the, of the telescope lined up with the holders, and you can see where it's lined up there. And I can define a location as a location that I want to study. All right. So this is sort of the, uh, the grid. I picked out these uh, various points to check. Um, I have at least 150 events at each location. Here's the statements for the trigger counters. As it turns out, the coincidence rate for this setup was something on the order of 1.5 events per minute. So this takes a large chunk of time to acquire a significant amount of data. All right, because these cosmic rays are for free, but over this little bit of surface area, there's not many of them per minute, okay? So it's an exercise in patience and as well as automation. Um, I also had to come up with a plan to sort of compile all the information. So I built a, what's called a tea tree container to hold the results. I built this infrastructure from scratch. Um, you can see here, I've got the relevant plots. I have information about the location. I have the high voltage settings in the file as well as uh, how many uh, pulses went into it. And you can see just a sample of that. And here's a sample over here of when you open this thing up and look at it, all the data, and you use that tree to do, do analysis. So let me get to sort of the preliminary results here. A position scan, you can see here on the upper left-hand corner, that's the pulse integral plots basically as a function of position. And you can see that it's actually not perfectly uniform. Right? Its response in one piece of the detector versus other is different. Not a terrible surprise. As a matter of fact, these corners are the ones that are in some sense furthest away from the PMT, which grabs the signal. So the light generated there actually has to travel the furthest distance to get to the light detector. So it's not a terrible surprise, actually, that we have a little bit lower response on those outer edges, because the PMT actually sits here in this picture. Okay. I do one dimensional analysis, calculate some correlation factors to see if I see any, any significant tilt. I don't, the line is the mean and so on and so forth. 
Okay. Uh, this is a uh, plot of the pulse height, basically how tall the pulses are, and uh, same kind of thing. And I supply that. I also have done a high voltage scan, so I basically run this thing at different high voltage settings. So here's the average wave at uh, negative 800 volts, 900, negative 1000, which is sort of the typical place that you would run this PMT. And then when you crank it up to 1100, um, this is what you get. All right, you can take that data, right, and you can fit it. The hypothesis suggests that something like this should go as a power law relationship. So I did a quick fit here, and you get something that fits quite well. Uh, so a power law hypothesis fits quite well, as expected, to the response as a function of high voltage setting. Okay. Um, again, this is the position uh, scan as a, at a different high voltage setting. All right, all kinds of stuff. I also did some efficiency studies. We were interested to understand what the true efficiency of the panel was. So what we did is we added in an additional scintillator down here at the bottom. We actually happen to have this, thanks to Dr. Kosminski, sitting in the lab. It's a Lewis paddle. We call it the Lewis paddle. And what this does is it gives us another trigger. So we've got basically a three coincidence. What we're saying here is essentially our signal of, uh, purity is essentially 100%. Then we look to see how often the panel fires with respect to that. The assumption is, based on the builders, the panel should work at a greater than about 96% level, based on uh, what, what they've experienced over decades of building these. Okay? Um, I had to acquire some new hardware to do this. Now, the counter I had, but I had to get it fixed, so I got a new a discriminator. Uh, this all happened basically last winter. All right, and you can see here um, that I've got PMT1, PMT2, the, the thing in, of study, and then I got the Lewis paddle down here, and you can see clear time correlation of, yes, that, that must be a cosmic ray muon that's going through essentially the speed of light. Okay? Um, and then I um, run a 500-event sample, which I assume is pretty pure. I check the efficiency. Basically, I check to see how many pulses I'm getting over the 500 events, and I see a non-zero uh, signal if I zoom in. So I see that this run indicates that the efficiency of this very pure signal of this detector is greater than the 96, 97 percent that the builders would suggest. Okay, I did some additional studies uh, where I separated the, out the power supplies. There's potential noise possibly sharing, so I, I separate these out. And this is just, uh, uh, again, I'm going to kind of go through this quickly, but I did some additional um, efficiency studies with that. And this is just sort of um, a summary of some of the different configurations I tried uh, to get a very, very pure signal as well as just a two coincidence signal to understand the efficiency of the, uh, of the panel. And with a very pure signal, uh, this triple coincidence guy, you can see sort of the average pulse integral response in volt nanoseconds and the efficiency with only 500 event statistics, mind you, okay, keep that in mind, uh, the efficiencies are consistent with what the NIU builders suggest and it would expect for such a device. Okay. I'm also keeping an eye on the law uh, of the performance of the panel uh, as a function of time. So I basically just take the panel, fire it up to a negative, kilo, a negative uh, 1,000 volts, and I just plug it right into a pico ammeter and just get sort of an average current right off of the device with nothing else plugged in. And you can see here are some dots down here, uh, you know, between negative eight and negative seven. Uh, nanoamps of current as a function of time, and I periodically just do it. I'm looking, I'm concerned that if this thing's degrading in some way, right, that all of a sudden this happens, right, or something like this happens, okay? So I'm just doing spot checks from time to time to make sure that uh, as a function of time it's stable. Um, and I've, of course, summarized this for, my, for my, uh, my colleagues. I've documented it in our internal system. This, again, these are all preliminary results and internal documentation. Um, but I've supplied a little piece of code to analyze the, the files I've given them, um, a piece of uh, basically the, the data where I've taken out some of the, uh, uh, the known outliers. This is the total file, and I've also built a user's guide for somebody so some of my, uh, my colleagues at Fermilab can understand what I, what I have done. So more of the details of this are all wrapped up in this do internal documentation. And now for something completely different. Guys are not old enough to appreciate Monty Python, I don't think. <clears throat> so, this is where we pivot and change. All right. Now I'm going to talk about basically some of the rocket science that I've been working on. Okay. So 
Here's a rocket, looks like a SpaceX rocket. There's a lot of this cool stuff going on, Bezos and all those guys, right, They're doing a lot of cool things. So aerospace technology has advanced over the hun past 100 years. We've gone from not being able to do this to being able to do it, and now we're being able to do it with you know, recycling our boosters and so on, okay? However, conventional fuels have what we call low specific impulse. The specific impulse is a very important parameter. It's essentially the figure of merit that compares all rocket propulsion, okay? Um, and it is the <clears throat> delivered impulse along this thrust axis, which we'll call Z, divided by mg, where m is the mass, or m is the mass of the fuel that you have to carry with you, right? Because you've got to burn something to go somewhere, okay? And we normalize, if you will, this impulse to the weight of the fuel that you have to carry around, okay? So let's put this in perspective. If we use the sort of the, the standard rocket equation and we plot it, so basically this delta V is the maximum change in velocity that the vehicle can attain as a function of the specific impulse and <clears throat> the masses, the, the mass, we call this often the wet mass of the, uh, of the rocket. That includes all its initial mass because it's got to carry its fuel with it, okay? versus its final mass after it's expended some things, you see this interesting relationship. And a couple of things I want to point out. Notice to even come close here to achieve even a fraction of the speed of light, right? This is meters per second. So this is uh, 1,000 meters per second. You'll notice that you have to go to relatively high specific impulses pretty quickly, all right? So bigger is better here, and specifically, Specific impulse has a huge effect on your capability of maneuvering around and going places, all right, in, in, in uh, rocket science. Just to give you an idea, chemical processes are on the level of 400 seconds. The specific impulse, if you do the math, just turns out to be seconds. That's what makes it a nice figure of merit you can compare everything with. Uh, Hall effect thermal uh, or electrodynamic or electromagnetic ion propulsion on the order of 1,000. Nuclear thermal, 3,000. Nuclear fission direct drives, 10,000 roughly. Nuclear fusion direct drives, 500,000. And antimatter, even more exotic drives above and beyond that. So my research focuses on these two, all right? And that's what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of this, uh, of this talk. So, the first we're going to talk about the antimatter drive. This was uh, initiated and done by uh, uh, undergraduate uh, Matt Dubiel, who was in the dual degree program and went on to IIT to get an engineering degree. Um, and he analyzed and worked on creating what we call the antimatter beam core engine. The premise is this. I take antiprotons, which are antimatter. I run them into normal matter. I know that they annihilate. The conversion from matter to energy is very, very efficient. It's basically 100%. That's what's nice about it, okay? And I take some of those energetic particles and I steer them into a certain direction. But to steer them, I know that I have to do some, uh, some fun magnetism. I have to create a non-uniform magnetic field or nozzle to direct the charged particles in the direction that I want. And this is the model that we've used uh, for this study. And what I want to do is I want to create, what he did was create a, a realistic model to optimize the efficiency of doing this, but more importantly probably to maximize the specific impulse that this thing can create. All right, we do this using what's called the JANT4 um, model system. Uh, here's all the details on the, the, the form that he used, okay? This is an object-oriented Monte Carlo system, open source, produced, peer-reviewed by collaboration of scientists throughout the world wide variety of applications, including many that are medical and space science based. And this is the design that he, he and I essentially came up with. <coughs> and when I say that we try to do something realistic, we actually went out and grabbed some, uh, uh, modeled this uh, superconducting alloy to represent essentially our, our magnetic field generator, all right? Um, we have an aluminum beam pipe in here because we're assuming that we need to steer the antiprotons to our target. We actually encase the target in a kind of a realistic stainless steel container and we put some aluminum sort of rods on there to hold it in space. So we tried to, at some level to create what you would consider sort of a, a real physical geometric model of how we would actually do this. Okay, and you can see here uh, there's little curls of red and blue and, and straight line greens. The neutrals are green, red are negative particles, and blue are positive particles. 
What I want to emphasize about this is, you know, it's kind of big, but it's not ridiculously big. And these are all materials that we actually know how to make and work with. So this, in some sense, is not so much science fiction. And as a matter of fact, we know how to make antiprotons. We've been doing it for years. Dr. Kaz and I, our PhD theses were dependent upon antiproton production. Okay? So here's just a little video of the, of the simulation of the antiproton annihilating and creating, you know, the point is this, this particle without proper magnetism, right, the magnetic field would actually be lost in this direction. But you can see what we did. Everything, all the charged particles get directed in the direction that we want, thus giving us a net thrust in the other direction. Okay? <clears throat> now, one problem is, in this annihilation process, there's a whole bunch of neutrals. Primarily gamma radiation comes out of this, so that's one sort of limiting concern. You wouldn't want to be real close to this engine when it's running. You want to make sure you're behind some shielding. All right? Uh, the charged particles can be redirected to produce th thrust via the magnetic nozzle. The neutrals, in some sense, represent a loss in terms of thrust. But one might argue, if I have a certain type of absorber, I could perhaps convert that to heat and use that to generate some electricity for me to actually pow power other items. All right. And here's a bit of the analysis that Matt got into. We optimized on the charged pions because they're the, the, the heaviest hitters hitting the exhaust plane. We want to maximize efficiency, so we kind of have to define what do we mean by our efficiency. We define if our efficiency, our average efficiency, as you can see the efficiency for pions hitting the exhaust is a function of their initial velocity or speed. This is the dimensionless speed parameter. So one is, or zero is zero, one is the speed of light, okay, just to let you know what that is. And what we define is sort of the average efficiency defined as the efficiency at which we get the average uh, velocity. So somewhere in here in this case. And we'd find that, go up to there and quote that as the efficiency uh, for this configuration. All right, optimize off of charged pions. <clears throat> All right, we also build our plots. And you can see here, this is a, uh, a plot of the Z component of the momentum at production of the pions. And you can see that it's pretty well centered. If you look at, the, look at the mean, it's pretty well centered over zero, which makes sense. The production process doesn't really care in some sense of which direction the daughter particles come out. There's no real bias necessarily in that. All right. But uh, once they hit the exhaust, if the thing is doing what it should be doing, the momentum should be shifted. And you can see the, the momentum final is over here, the exhaust momentum. You can see this distribution basically got shifted in that direction. And then the difference between those two on an event by, or a, a particle by particle level, we actually create our impulse plot here in MeV per C, because it's the same units as momentum. And the point is we want to maximize this. We want to take that, that mean and we want to configure such that we push that mean as far to the right as possible. To the right, yes, to the right as possible. Okay? So that's what Matt did. He spent uh, a sure summer working on this, doing what, you know, he did a bunch of 1D analysis and changed a bunch of parameters, the radius, the maximum uh, B field, the length of the, uh, of the solenoid, and generated 100,000 events per trial. He was running on the MAC cluster that used to be down the hall over there, and he had like four or five machines going at the same time. It was fantastic. They were all just purring away and, and going about their business. It was great. Okay. Now I do want to emphasize this was a 1D analysis, so one might argue that there's definitely room for improvement if you're thinking about possible correlations between these terms, which we fully expect, but we have not fully analyzed, to be fair. All right, and then just here are some of his uh, results. Uh, here's his vari variation uh, parameter set, where he started, where he ended up, how much he changed, and this is sort of the optimized parameter set that he came up with. So what, what we say is, if you want to build one of these devices, you want to get your antiprotons with a kinetic energy of about 23 MeV, which is not terribly difficult to do. All right, it's not really that energetic. You want a B max of about 18 Tesla. Now that's non-trivial, I'll be completely honest with you. That's a pretty legitimate field. B min, pretty small, solenoid length 2.25 meters, solenoid radius about 2.25 meters, so this thing's kind of symmetric from that standpoint. And you want to put your production where it runs into the, the hydrogen, you want to put that sort of downstream to optimize your chance of those backscattered ones getting a chance to basically turn around and get put out the exhaust port, okay? And this was published a few years ago um, 
in the Journal of Modern Physics, as a matter of fact. It was accepted and, and published. And an undergraduate, Matt, was the primary author on this. Yep, so I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud of him. Now, one of the biggest factors, limiting factors. Now, first of all, look at the specific impulses. They're fantastic. This is the, really the one to focus on. If I'm thinking about all particles, I'm getting a specific impulse of 79 um, MeV per C. Oh, I'm sorry, the average impulse Z is 79, which translates to a specific impulse of 1.29 times 10 to the sixth, right? There's my million number that I was kind of looking for for such processes uh, in seconds. However, the availability of antimatter, the current maximum production rate is on the order of 10 to the seventh antiprotons per second. So yeah, we can do this in small little bumps, but not at this point, we cannot supply enough antiprotons to get a significant amount of newtons of thrust over a, strong, a long period of time. So that's the biggest limiting factor. And the 18 Tesla fields are what I would consider non-trivial as well. But in principle, we have a, at least a place to start to say, if you were to want to build one of these things that does a certain job, this is a good place to start. Oh, look, he's leaving right now. Let's switch over to this and embarrass Merrick because he's leaving. Um, now we're going to switch over to the fusion drive. Why? Because antimatter is really, 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 really hard to come by. It's really difficult to make. So then you switch to the other high specific impulse things like, hey, what about fusion? That's something that's difficult, but in terms of fuel, the fuel's all over the place. So that's precisely what Merrick, who just left, um, is working on. So again, we want to create a realistic model to optimize efficiency and maximize specific impulse. It uses many of the same resources. I envision this as basically taking the, the antimatter core out and putting a fusion core in because we know the magnetic field ideas work, right? It's directing the charged particles where we want them to go, all right? So the same general solenoid structure and materials, we did go to an updated version of JANT4 um, with all the uh, appropriate goodies in the physics list that would work for what we're doing, all right? Now, when you talk about fusion, you have to talk, think about what process that you want to pick. Now, if you know something about deuterium-deuterium fusion, it's compelling. Uh, it, it triggers at a sort of a lower temperature, but the big problem with the deuterium-deuterium fusion, as you can see here in sort of this uh, fusion uh, uh, equation, it produces helium-3 with a you know, kind of an okay kinetic energy, but the kicker is it tends to produce neutrons, and neutrons are electrically neutral, and therefore can I steer them with a magnetic field? No. Whoever you had for General Physics 2 probably should have t discussed that with you. If they didn't, talk to Dr. Kosminski. And they should have a talking to. Yes? Okay. So <clears throat> it's compelling, but because of that neutron daughter product, we know for a fact that we would lose those in terms of potential thrust. Okay. So we're currently focusing on this process, the deuterium-helium-3 process, which gives us helium-4, basically an alpha particle, at a pretty decent kinetic energy, right? as well as a pretty energetic proton at 14.7 MeV. And we know these things work because you've, you, nuclear physicists have actually been doing these processes for a long time and study these. So these numbers aren't like fictitional or like just made up. These are pretty well-known physics process numbers, OK? Uh, so that's the, um, that is what we've decided to, to focus on. We're assuming a fusion pl uh, plasma sphere of a radius 40 millimeters uh, at the center of the engine core. Fusion uh, products decouple from the sphere isotropically. So we basically model that they come off the plasma in any old direction, right? Which seems to make sense because you've got a bunch of these getting heated up over time. They're just going to come off in random directions. All right. We assume that we have a, a, a higher ratio of helium-3 to deuterium to reduce those deuterium-deuterium um, scenarios. Because if I'm fusing deuterium and helium-3, that means there's other deuterium around, yes? Then deuterium and the deuterium can fuse, causing this neutron problem again. But I basically um, sort of mediate that a little bit by increasing the rate of input of the helium-3 isotope. And you can see here a model of, um, that, uh, that Merrick came up with uh, of fusion events. We've got uh, green neutral tracks, proton tracks are red, alpha particles are blue, and the helium-3 tracks are in white. Okay? And you might ask, well, where'd the, uh, the neutrons come from? Again, we are simulating at a lower rate 
we're simulating deuterium deuterium fusion, which does give us some uh, neutron daughter products. And you can see they just pretty much go in a straight line, and we can't do much with them, except possibly capture them to heat some material for electricity generation. So very preliminary results. Uh, Merrick did a sanity check on my magnetic field calculation. Basically, what we decided to do is, hey, hey, why don't we boost B min up to be exactly equal to B max? What should this thing act like? The magnetic field's now uniform. It should act basically like a perfect solenoid. So if I look, uh, the contrast is a little bit bad here. I apologize. But if you look at the impulse plot, you can see that it's pretty well centered on zero, which makes perfect sense. So we actually did a study where he increased B min to B, B, B max and even went a little bit further. And guess what happened? Instead of steering everything this way, whoop, everything got stored. All right? So that's a sanity check to basically make sure that the magnetic field algorithm actually makes sense. And it seems like it's doing exactly what we expected it to do. Again, over the summer, Merrick has been generating thousands and hundreds of thousands of events per trial, per data point, and trying to understand the response of the impulse versus length, the uh, efficiency versus length, radius, and Bmax, and so on. Again, this is still just a one-dimensional analysis, and that means that I think there's a lot of room for improvement, and that's one of the next steps that Merrick, I think, is going to take, is to try to actually explore the multi-dimensional space. The hope is there might be some magic um, location in the parameter space that we get a real significant increase in impulse that you would perhaps miss by just doing 1D slices. All right, But based on um, uh, Merrick's preliminary results, he says, hey, Dr. Hooper, let's build this thing to be a length of uh, 9.5 meters by 5.25 meters. B max, notice here the magnetic field maximum is significantly de less than the, than the anti, uh, antimatter version. So that's a bonus for this as well, as a matter of fact. The magnetic fields that we need to generate are completely legitimate. If you go back to the mu de experiment, we're generating and we have solenoids that are actually built to generate fields kind of this size anyway. Right? So this is now, it's not so much science fiction anymore, we actually have the technologies to build such a thing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> efficiency about 71%, and you can see here the uh, impulse plot um, under these conditions, and you can see uh, an, imp an average impulse of 107.8 MeV per C, which translates into, I was surprised by this, actually. I was expecting something like 200,000, just, just, just off the top of my head. And I find that this specific impulse is actually much higher than I sort of anticipated. So that was sort of a, a wonderful surprise, because that's going in the right direction. The larger the specific impulse, the more possibility I have to carry less fuel but to get more done in traversing the solar system. Now, some limiting factors. Sustaining the, the, the fusion plasma, that's, of course, a difficult thing to do. It inherently wants to slip out of the magnetic bottle. Um, and, of course, the availability of helium-3 is a significant issue. All right, but there is a possibility that there's significant amounts of it on the moon that we could, in principle, harvest. Uh, helium-3 is a lot easier to come by than antiprotons, by like a lot, to use a non-scientific term. Okay? <clears throat> And it also has some of these additional uh, advantages. So, not bad, done. Lots of work still to do to get mu e running. We're hoping for first trickles of beam in a few years. Of course, everything was delayed because of, well, COVID, the dirty word. Yes? <clears throat> All right. Um, for any hope of deep, deep space travel, if you want to go somewhere in the universe at any chunk of the any chunk legitimate chunk of the speed of light, you really have to think in terms of exotic propulsion systems at this point. All right, um, and if any of this looks interesting, you want to explore some other crazy and wild idea, then please let me know. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Questions? I know the, the raging question is, it's gloomy out, it's Friday, Dr. Hooper, can we go home? Yes, I know that's the question. All right, we're going to go Dr. Koz and then Dr. Kosminski. Or, yeah, Dr. Koz, <laughs> Dr. Koz, Dr. Keller. All right, Dr. Koz. Ah, like a, like a secondary, so if you were to go back to here. <coughs> so, 
So you're saying, whoops, hello. For instance, this one here, how often does that possibly go back in and mingle up an, another fusion? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, well um, off the top of my head, I, I don't remember the, the, the cross-section rates for that. Um, and I can also say at this level of the model in JAN, we don't model that. Um, in principle, I actually don't model the fusion. I'm just modeling these daughter products, assuming the fusion's going on in the core. Yeah. Because yeah, JAN 4 is not what you'd consider, what you'd consider like a, a, a nuclear physics generation uh, of event generator. But it does allow me to just say, hey, I know I have this stuff running around. I can dial in exactly those numbers and make them isotropic and let them run. Yep. But uh, I think what I would do is possibly then look at the ratios of uh, proton deuterium fusion, see how it relates to these other ratios, and I could just tack those on as additional uh, additional uh, generation events and sort of so, sort of some sort of a pro appropriate weighting factor, which is what I do with these. Actually, I weight these at basically a factor of one third less than than these are are occurring. But to answer your question, it should happen. It does happen. The rate off the top of my head, I, I don't know. With, with these conditions. But we could, in principle, model it by just doing some sort of ratio analysis. Yeah. Dr. Kelleher. Yeah, I guess I have a couple, a couple of questions. So one, in the apparatus that you were using here, uh, in the lab downstairs, yeah. the 3D printed parts and yep. all that stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Is there any potential of loss to the material? Uh, you should keep saying you're, you're putting it into to, to pain, right? Yeah. And you're passing it through this kind of cell there, right? You want to be light and tight, obviously. Yep. But if you scatter out, or just because I know the 3D printed parts are just quite rough after you make them. Yeah. So yeah. You know, is there a possibility that there's any artifacts from the roughness of the material um. and from the paint that you use? Because I'm assuming these detectors are some organic component, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, so um, the, the muon, muon is what we call a uh, minimum ionizing particle. So basically, it eff effectively, the, this cosmic ray muon is just ripping right through this stuff. And even the trickle of light that we, ha we get out is pretty minimal. It's not a lot. Uh, but I understand your question. The question is, right, could, could the material itself actually have an influence on the... the um, Let's see if I can find a good picture here. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Right. You're thinking possibly it, it comes in here, has some effect before it gets into this guy. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I mean, there is a small probability that the muon could come in, really rattle around in one of these nuclei and shower like a son of a pup. And every once in a while, you'll see those. But statistically speaking, it's more than likely that actually was just due to an additional muon sh cosmic ray shower that actually occurred in the atmosphere. And from time to time, you'll see that. You'll see events. If I go eye by eye through the, 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 the panel response, where the thing just, I mean, it just lights up. It basically saturates this PMT. The PMT just goes into saturation mode, and you see this huge blob. And so it's a, it's a photocathode. It's a cathode that basically, when the photons come in, so they're generated in the scintillator, right? They're generated in the scintillator. Let me kind of get to here. Uh, I mean, that's that piece of scintillator, but let's get to the, this guy. Yeah, there we go. Right? It goes through. It's, it's generated the scintillator, and roughly speaking, that plastic, that type of plastic with the doping has in there, it, it's scintillation light peaks in kind of the blue, which is a problem. Exactly, and that's why we have the wave shifters in there. So that light, wherever that muon went through, it, shatters, it, it scatters out scintillation light that's too, it's too blue to transport through plastic to some other location. So what happens is we've got these uh, fiber optics that have a wave shifter um, uh, in, in it. So that blue light gets captured in the, the fiber optic 
and gets transmuted from blue down to more of the greenish level. And the attenuation of the green is on the order of meters, not centimeters for that light. And then it's basically trapped, internally reflected, trapped in the fiber optic, and then it's ported out to the PMT. So it's charged particle goes through, generates a burst of light. Hopefully it's captured by the light turned to green, and then transmitted over here, and the PMT is a photocathode that photoelectric affects an electron out the other side, is how it works. Yeah. I was just thinking about, because the wave shifters are some organic component. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just wondering for pain and things like that, as you bring those things in, your wave shift before you get into your system. But the muon itself actually is not, is, it is, is, a, is a massive charged particle, right? The muon itself is not light, it's a massive particle. It just, when it goes through pretty much anything, it basically can rattle around some molecules and possibly ionize them at some level. It just so happens that this scintillator is really good at that. And then converting some of that, that energy, that, the little bit of energy that, that that muon lost, it converts it to a little light pulse and then we gather it up and go, and go about our business. So pretty much that cosmic ray muon doesn't, statistically speaking, doesn't even notice that the 3D printed part is there. Because these things are traveling at 98% of the speed of light. Yeah, yeah these things pretty, pretty much, much go straight. straight. That's, that's why, why this the setup, setup you know, is kind of nice. because it says, hey, you notice here, I didn't put any probability of this thing rattling around. Uh, of course it's possible, it's just really, really highly unlikely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what's, how far does muons penetrate? Does it matter in general? Like, oh, the mean free path is uh, through the atmosphere. It's miles and miles and miles. Actually, they're generated. These things are actually generated um, in our reference frame <laughs> because relativity comes into play here. Because these things are traveling about 98 percent of the speed of light. They're generated like you know, uh, 10,000, 20,000 feet in the atmosphere, maybe a little further. Um, and then they, most of the time, there are a bunch of them going through you right now. It's just that minimal ionization effect. They don't really rattle around much in, 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 in you. So their damage to you because of the rate is not terribly big. Interestingly enough, if we had a supernova go off too close to planet Earth, the muon flux could actually become dangerous to humans on the planet. Um, but the answer is these things penetrate miles of air and feet of dirt. So you're from your set up outside? There's a possibility. Actually, um, in the basement. Yeah. If, if I were to do rate analysis, right, I could take it out of the basement and move it to the roof. And in principle, I would expect to see the rate go up, the amount that I get come, I see go up. Yeah. Yeah. And this might be an elementary question, but when you were explaining the why for this project, you referenced aluminum a lot. What's the purpose of that? Okay, so um, let me let me go to this. The aluminum goes back to the, the, the main purpose of mu de. Right. So if I come back here, yeah. So if I come here, Amy, and I go, all right, <clears throat> I'm looking for a process that looks like this. Okay. Now, the problem with muons, as we pointed out, is they just go zipping through stuff, right? They're hard to kind of lock down and allow to sort of linger for a while, shall we say, okay? So one way to do that is to allow them to get captured in an orbit around, in this case, aluminum. And we know that capture process is pretty well studied by the nuclear physics community, and that's a pretty well known process. So we picked aluminum to say there's a pretty good chance that if we give a, a, a muon of a Kind of the right energy, by the way. It can't just be any old muon. We gotta kind of we gotta kind of dial this thing in to be about the right energy. Roughly, we're talking GED level, as a matter of fact. That it can come in here and get bound up, and then basically get bound in this orbit. And hopefully, when that happens, if if it can transmute just to an electron, it might. And that little excess, excess energy of the electron comes off. You can see this thing wobble a little bit to conserve, uh, conserve momentum and so on. But that gives a clean signal that this capture and re readmission of the electron occurs. If you do the math, it comes up to be exactly that number. 
if the muon converted directly to the electron and there was no neutrinos extra running around. So we pick aluminum because it has a pretty reasonable capture cross-section of the type of muons that we're going to generate. So we actually have this, 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 the, what we call the stopping target. It's basically it's, it's, it's an aluminum array of aluminum, and we run those muons into it to see if this actually happens. Yes? So is that 105 mega electron volts? Is that a binding energy for an electron in orbit, or this this one here? Um, no, this would be the this would be the this is the kinetic energy of the electron after this process occurs that it, it, it carries with it to the outside world. Okay. Yeah. So if you run the numbers on this, basically one jet muon coming in, getting bound up in this, going through this transition, and then. If it were to transmute directly with no other neutrinos, so the key is there's no neutrinos to take to bleed off some of the other energy. If that were to happen, there's a very clear energetic signal of exactly that number that that electron should carry with it. And I don't have the plots here, but well, actually you can kind of see the plots here. If you run, if you run the numbers, right, we're basically looking at a signal that should should exist right here. Right off the sort of the edge of some known uh, processes, so we're looking for something that in principle should pop up right here at this level. And it, the hope is there's enough separation that's the event you measure. Yeah, that's the, the detective event. Yeah, we're, we're gonna look for it. It, it. There's a really good chance you don't see anything. You find it once. But if we do see a, you know a smattering of ten of them over the course of a three-year run it will be earth shattering because it means there is some new physics causing that transmutation that the standard model does not account for. Could it be Susie? Then there's of course theoretical models all over the place to say, well, okay, I can explain why that happens. Any other questions? It's been a long week, right? Yeah. I appreciate your attention, ladies and gentlemen, I really do. Thanks, thanks for listening. Thank you.